Okay, welcome back. Uh, let's get into where we stopped from where we stopped. Okay, uh, the early church was preached. Sorry, the early church preached preached the cross of Christ. Right. So when we look at the early church, we talked about Apostle Paul, uh, but here in the very first sermon, uh, the Apostle Peter, uh, in chapter two, he stands up and he speaks these words: "Jesus of Nazareth, man attested by God." Uh, attested by God to you by miracles, signs, and wonders. And so he preaches the gospel. Uh, Peter, again, in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John go to pray. Uh, they see this lame man, and he says, Silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Right, And then they, after all of this, they said, How did you do this? Good question, no? One thing I know is Peter, you are good. You're good with fishes. You're good with the boat. Who taught you all of this? That's look at this reply. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, rulers of the people of and elders of Israel. If this day you are, are judged for a good deed done to a hopeless man, by what means he has he has been made well? Now let me tell you what what I did. To all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but God raised from the dead, and by and by him this man stands here before you whole. Can you think of these Pharisees, these leaders, these rabbis, wearing all their clothes and you know they're walking around, they know everything from Abraham. All the Old Testament, all the law they know. It's all here. They're asking Peter, see, we've seen this man here lame for many years. With what authority you're doing this? See, you can't do okay. At least I'm doing no. You can't do it. I'm doing it. But you want to know what authority? The authority of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You leaders put him to death. But now God raised him from the dead. Can you think of these rabbis and leaders? They have, they have already lost the battle. They feel they are leaders, but they are not leaders. This fisherman here is in control of the situation. Fisherman. Doesn't know anything. He only knows how to fish. Catch fish. Try it, fry it, sell it. That's all he knows. Now he's saying, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. They preached the cross of Jesus Christ when they were faced with persecutions and threat. In Acts chapter 5, again, because of all of this, they said, okay, bring those two, Peter and John here. And the council is standing, okay, listen. Whatever you're saying, what you've done to that lame man, good. Just say God has healed him. But stop preaching about this Jesus because you know and I know that Jesus was dead in front of our own eyes. We crucified him. We killed him. We, you've seen him dead. Peter is saying, hey, but I also told you he rose again from the dead. The tomb is empty. So I'm going to decide whether I should believe in you or obey you or should I obey God. So it's obvious that I'm going to obey God. They go on to preach the gospel. And the early church preached the gospel and even you and I are to preach the gospel. In Acts 10, well, the first sermon to the Gentiles, right, uh, where Peter preaches, right, uh, and the people were filled with the Holy Spirit and uh, and, and so we see that everywhere, when people preached, it was followed up with signs, wonders, and miracles. It was. When people believed in the cross, there was miracles. Very important is not to look at the cross only for miracles. The cross is more than that. It's a place of salvation. It's a place of forgiveness. It's a place of love. But it's also a place of justice. Right? 
It's not only miracles. Miracles is one of it. We thank God for the miracles when we believe in the cross. Miracles is one of the free, buy one, get one free. You've heard of that, right? In the supermarkets. You get the cross, buy one, get 100 free. You can't buy the cross, but you believe you will get all of this, right? The main message of the church then and the main message of the church now must be the cross. We cannot replace the message of the cross with good music, with friendly people, with organized programs, fun activity, you know, all of this. We cannot replace it. Now, remember the word replace. You can have motivational speeches, you know, uh, feel good sermons. None of this can save a person's soul. Now, there's a time and place for everything. When we go for a youth missions, example, we go for a youth meeting or a youth missions, you cannot stand there and say, oh, this is what Jesus did. This is the cross. It's going to be, you know, skits and activities and fun. That's what the youth meeting is. We need to have it. But along with that, the main focus should be the cross of Jesus Christ. If you go for a meeting, you come out of that meeting saying the auditorium was looking good. The whole meeting, the purpose of the meeting is lost. You get what I'm saying? Right? We cannot replace good music. Is good music important? Good worship important? Very important. But David, he had 4,000 skilled musicians and he made rosters. He said, okay, this went on for 30 years. Right? Yeah. Morning, one team. Afternoon, evening, one team. Night, 24-7, there was worship. Skilled musicians. It's important. But we cannot replace this good music with, you know, or good our messages or, or feel good sermons, motivational speeches with the cross of Jesus Christ. You have to preach the cross. You have to preach what Jesus did on the cross. That's when people are touched and people are saved. You get this, right? So, for example, you go back to your hometowns, you say, let's have a youth meeting. Let's call all people from different villages and different towns. Let them come. We'll have a youth meeting. And you bring them all together. And we are, you're, you're saying, okay, so this whole day we'll have this, 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 this. So we'll have first one session. Then we'll have a uh, fun time and activity. But in those sessions, make sure that the cross of Jesus Christ is preached. The power of the cross. Whatever the topic is. The topic could be how to be good in the workplace. Bring in the cross. Bring in what Jesus did for us on the cross. Only that can touch a person's life. Testimonies will be there for some time. People will remember your testimony for some time. But the cross, when you speak of the cross, it goes into your spirit. It changes your life. How many of you remember the first time you prayed? And you said, Lord Jesus, change me. I want to believe in you. I want to trust in you. How many of you remember that time? You all don't remember? Yes or no? You, at least you remember, okay, I was here in this place. This is what I was saying. I was feeling sad. I was feeling happy. I prayed. Yes? Right? That moment, that, that moment is much more precious than any other moment. If you're not preaching the cross, you're not preaching the gospel. The cross is what will make the effect of the sermon or the teaching more powerful. Our own words. It will be our own way of communicating. But what we're doing is we're communicating the cross. Right? So there is the practical of preparing. But the dependence must be on God. We cannot change any person's heart. We cannot make a person believe in the cross. Only God can do that. 
So remember this. If you're not preaching the cross, you're not preaching the gospel. It's just a good time together. It's just another sermon. Right? Try to relate everything that you're doing to the cross of Jesus Christ. That is the center of all humankind. The simple gospel is the power of God. Even as you share this, don't be ashamed. And sometimes we, people may be may ridicule you, make fun of you, they may laugh at you, mock you. Remember, they did that to Jesus. Yes or no? They looked at Jesus, they ridiculed him, they mocked him, they made fun of him. They pulled out his beard, they spat on his face. They did everything that they could do. At least now nobody is doing that for us. So as believers, we must be willing to share the power, the message of the cross. Because this is the power of God unto salvation. Okay. All right, let's get into the shadows of the cross. Now, we talked about this, right? Before the foundations of the world, we preach Christ crucified. So, in the Old Testament, in many places, God showed his people what is going to happen through a sign, through shadows. And we know many of them. So, let's look at a few of them, right? See, in the, in the Old Testament, in, in Luke chapter 24, uh, there's this whole, this whole section where uh, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Jesus is, has died. He has resurrected from the dead. And now he's coming to meet his disciples. And he says, Ought not the Christ, verse 26, Ought not the Christ have suffered these, these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures. Oh, this is uh, uh, on the road to Emmaus. He expounded to them all in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was with you. That all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scripture. Look at this, such an important example for us. Jesus has done all the work. He has defeated the enemy. He's resurrected from the dead. He's coming back. And not only is he showing himself alive, he's saying, see, I'm alive. Thomas, come in touch. Peter, don't doubt anymore. Disciples, I'm here. I'm flesh and blood. I'm here standing in front of you. He does all that, but he also says, it is written in the scriptures. From the time of Moses, it was revealed that the Son of God had to come. He had to suffer. He had to go through this. He had to die. And he expounded the scripture. That means what? It's like you, you know, two people standing and, he, and he's opening the scriptures. Hey, but you know what? Psalm says this. This is what the book of Acts is saying. This is what Moses said. This is what Joseph said. This is what Daniel did, expounding the scripture. That's what Jesus did. Jesus and the word are one. You know, sometimes, in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 is powerful. It says, in, those, in the last days, God will speak through his son. Yes? How will God speak? He'll speak through his son. What is, who is his son? Jesus. Who is Jesus? The word. So during these times, even now, it's very important to understand that we can go to God's word, read God's word, and God is speaking to us. The problem is sometimes we want a prophetic word, we want a vision, we want a dream, we want all kinds of confirmations, we want word of knowledge, we want this, that, all that. There's a time and place for that. But remember, God is speaking through his word. That is the most powerful 
word that you and I can receive. God, you said you will send your word and heal my disease. That's it. It's done. By the stripes of Jesus, we were healed. Now, what are you standing on? You're standing on what Jesus has done. You're not standing on a prophecy of somebody else. You're standing on what Jesus has done. Prophecy is there. Good. Vision is there. Good. You're standing on something much more powerful. What Jesus is telling only you're standing on. That's why the word is so powerful. Let the word of God be in your spirit, be in your heart. Let it not, you know, David says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. He's a king of Israel and he's saying, I've hidden my word. Keep the word in you. Suddenly there will be a storm in life. You have the word of God. Sometimes we don't know where to run and the storm comes. Who to go to, which pastor to call, which brother to call, where to go, what to do, confused. Go back to the word. Say, God, your word says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise a standard against him. So now I can see a flood. It's coming against me. But your word says you will raise a standard. You will stand. Isaiah 43, when the waters come, it shall not overcome you. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. For I am with you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God, I'm feeling weak, I'm feeling weary, I'm feeling fearful, tired. I've heard this news, I'm fearful. It's natural. You got the word of God. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's showing them through the word of God. See, I'm not doing something that I, just to make, fear, make you fear. The cross was not just to make you feel scared and abandon you. The, it was written years back from Moses. And there are signs. Let's look at the first sign. The seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Whatever Jesus did on the cross. Right, this is written Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head. Where did Jesus do this? Where did Jesus bruise the Satan's head? He crushed the devil on the cross. But it was written 4,000 years before. Right? He shall bruise your head. It's like the father is telling the devil, I will send somebody. And he will destroy you. Now, you are saying you brought in death into this world. You have made, you have tempted Adam and you have brought sin into this world. But I will, there'll come a time when my own seed will crush your head. What a powerful example. God the Father is saying this, my, my seed, my own flesh and blood will destroy you, will crush the serpent's head. And then in Genesis 3, what did God do after that? Adam and Eve just realized, hey, I'm naked. Don't have any clothes because sin has entered them. What did Jesus, what did God do? The first clothing, he did the first sacrifice. We talked about this, right? The covering for sin can only be provided by shedding of blood. Right? Uh, Genesis 3.21. And also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Who made the tunics of skin? God. He, he sacrificed an animal, he, he sacrificed the blood, and he clothed them. A picture of what Jesus would do. That while we were yet sinners, living in sin, Jesus came into this world. He gave his own life as a blood offering. And that by his blood, we are cleansed. He clothes us with his power. He covers us with his blood talking about what Jesus did. Then we have Abel's sacrifice in Genesis 4. Now Adam knew his wife and they conceived and uh, she bore this time uh, Cain was born and then the second time Abel was born 
Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. We know the story. Uh, Abel bought the firstborn of his flock of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. Verse 5. But he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Worship that is not accepted, that is will not be accepted by God, must come based. Sorry, what am I saying? Worship that will be accepted by God must come based on the shedding of blood. We cannot come into the presence of God without the shedding of blood. Right? We cannot come into God by our own efforts. You look at other faiths, there is shedding of blood. Used the wrong way. See, the devil is a impersonator. Whatever God does, he'll try to do it. You have the original, you have the fake. Both look the same. But both have different value. How many of you have gone to the shop, you bought something and then the storekeeper looks at the note like this? Ah, this is a real note. If it's fake, he'll throw it on your face. This is a fake note. Right? But it looks the same. The same thing with the enemy. He, he he has his own things. But here we're focusing on what God did here. What Abel did. Abel gave the best of what he had. It was a blood offering. God's provision for Abraham's sacrifice. Oh, this is God provided the lamb. Oh, this is a perfect example. You read the life of Isaac and you read the life of Jesus. Their nature is almost the same. The first covenant child. Here, the first child as a covenant from God himself. God told Abraham, take Isaac, go and sacrifice him in the mountain. So Abraham does it. We know the story, right? As the spear was coming, the knife was coming on his son. God said, stop. There's a ram. Take that ram. Cut it. Give it as a burnt offering. But many years later, on the Mount of Golgotha, this time, God, Abraham was not there. God himself was holding the... Just making, painting a picture for you. God himself is holding like a knife. And this time, he didn't stop. Because he told Abraham, I myself will provide. This time in Golgotha, God said, no. It has to be done. And on his own son, the punishment and judgment came. It was to show about what Jesus would do. It's a shadow of the cross. The Passover lamb. We know the story, right? I'll just summarize this entire chapter. What happens? Everyone know the Passover lamb? Right? The final judgment. God tells Moses, okay, tell the people of Israel and tell Pharaoh if this is what's going to happen. All the male children, firstborn of the house is going to die. But you people, because you're in covenant with me, Cut a lamb without blemish. Take the blood and put it on your doorposts. And when death comes, death will see that and it will pass by. Death will see the blood. Death will see the blood and it will pass by. What did Jesus do for us? Christ is our Passover lamb. Right? He typified everything that when we are covered by the blood of Jesus, that shall pass by. Right? Christ brings the reality of the Lamb into our life. That cannot hold us. Even as believers, death is not the end. It's just that we are going to a different place. That's it. From one place to another, from our place of sin to a place of glory.
That's all it is. Right? Christ is our Passover lamb. He shed his blood. We don't have to take blood and put it on our doorposts. He has already done it for us. He has, we are already sealed by the blood of Jesus. Yes? Do we believe this? Right? We are sealed by the blood of Jesus. Then, now there's a question here. Is this, uh, after resurrection, Jesus conquered Satan and death. But why Satan still continues to tempt mankind? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Gertrude, to answer your question, see, uh, Jesus defeated the devil. Right? So right now, you and I, as when we become believers, we are victorious. Jesus has not bound the devil yet. We see that in the book of Revelations. In the book of Revelations, Satan will be taken and bound for a thousand years. That time, there will be no sin. Right? But now, Satan is continuing his work. He will keep doing what he has to do. That is why Jesus is, you know, Jesus is not saying, okay, I finished the work and now everything is all right. No, he's saying, I finished the work, I'm giving you my Holy Spirit, I'm giving you my weapons, I'm giving you everything that I have, and I'm I'm going to be there with you. You gotta fight this fight of faith. Nothing was easy for Jesus. He had to go through it. So the same way, we have to go through it. But we have this assurance that Jesus is with us. So Gertrude, this whole thing of, you know, uh, why Satan still keeps continuing to tempt us and cause all these problems, because he's still working. He knows he's defeated, so he's doing his best. And you'll learn more in the book of Revelations. There'll come a time Jesus will take him, bind him for a thousand years. That time, there will be no sin. That's why the book of Isaiah talking about that says, uh, that, that time will be where the lion and the lamb will sit together. There'll be no death during the thousand year period. So, right. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, welcome. Okay, the rock from which the water flowed. Okay, this we know. All of us know this, right? Uh, Exodus 17, they've come to disciple. The Israelites are walking from Egypt. They're coming. It's so funny, you know, you think of it. Israelites are coming out. They say, oh, were there no graves in Egypt? You brought us here. We would have been working in Egypt, eating and drinking and sleeping, enjoying. At least we had something there. Yeah, you brought us here to die in the desert. God is said, you know, Moses is telling, what do I do with these people? He says, okay, hit the rock. You see that rock? Moses, take your stone, take your staff and hit the rock. And water started flowing from the rock. Now think about this. They were so happy. They all the Israelites went and took, started drinking water, quenching their thirst. Oh, thank you. They quenched their thirst. They probably filled water and that water kept flowing where they went. Think about this. They forgot to look at the miracle that happened. They're all filling their water bottles. They forgot about the miracle. What's the miracle? There is no, there is no clouds in the sky. It is hot in the desert. There's no sign of any water in the ground. But David, Moses hit the rock and water is flowing out. Did anyone stop and think of that? If I was there, I would have said, hey, I, mean, I don't know. I would have maybe ran to the water, but I would have thought, where is the water coming from? It's a miracle. They didn't see the miracle. I want the water. The water followed them. But the point is, that water was what led them. And the Bible says that rock was Jesus. That rock was Jesus. And out of your belly will come rivers of living water. He is our living water. Right. Jesus was that rock, and that rock followed him everywhere they went. 
then comes a difficult part moses the people are again crying they've got into the habit of crying again so now speak to the rock tell the rock water come out no 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 we'll hit it last time we hit no water came moses hit the rock that one small mistake because you disobeyed me by the rivers of kadesh and uh, and near that uh, near that area you will not enter the promised land why was god do you, do you feel that was too much i feel it was too much god what about look at what all we have we've met face to face we have talked together i was 40 days on the mountain and talking to you and i said i want to see you and i saw the back your back going nobody has seen that even the israelites could not see my face because of the glory of god and you're saying because i hit the rock second time you're not letting me into the promised land which i have brought all the people out of here <laughs> you're not letting me in because i hit the rock god is saying yes i told you to speak to it why because that rock is jesus he was smote once and that's going to be only once next time you just have to go to the cross and speak to him and when you speak to him rivers of water will flow to us refreshing us right so god was trying to bring out a message from that then we have the levitical offerings the burnt offering right um leviticus it has a lot of offerings right the book of leviticus but every single offering points to jesus christ every single offering points to jesus first one the burnt offering thought about substitution instead of my place instead of me going and you know suffering jesus did it for me so instead of me suffering we'll put this goat here burn it and god will accept this offering it's a burnt offering so now instead of the goat of instead of the lamb jesus has taken my place sin offering covering of intentional unintentional and unknown sins trespass offering covered known and confessed sins peace offering it spoke of the reconciliation christ would provide through his cross right so all of them and the day of atonement i think i've shared this many times right one day in the year the high priest would go into the holy of holies make atonement that's what jesus did for us he became our sin offering he became our sin bearer and he went up to heaven and he made atonement for us next one the serpent in the wilderness how many of us remember this story numbers 21 again the israelites you know you read exodus leviticus numbers even joshua it's so i don't understand like how you know that's the nature of man sometimes we feel why is god so upset why is god so angry not angry it's mercy because it's so they have seen the miracles they have seen what god can do yet no what happens here they're grumbling ah oh, the same old manna same taste same desert same thing same thing moses will go pray and come and he'll tell us the same thing aaron is there we have to go and give one goat there he will do the sacrifice same thing nothing is interesting here then we have then they'll blow one trumpet we have to move then we have to do this what is this they grumbling they didn't see that their even the slippers on their feet were not torn they didn't see that and none of the diseases that fell on the egyptians came on them then see all that but they grumbling so hot now the water also is becoming bitter everything is going wrong grumbling what did god do he sent serpents okay grumbling go think of the serpents are going everywhere biting the people people are dying right people are dying then god said 
sorry, then Moses said, God, don't let them die of snake bites. What will the Egyptians think? Please save them. OK, here's what you do. You take a brass pole, take one serpent, and tie it around the brass pole. And when the serpents, when you get bit by the serpent, just look at that pole, and you will live. I think Moses would have said, I'm too old for all of this. Why all this? Right. But he did it. Put the pole, brass, sin is like a fiery serpent. Its sting is death. The serpent represents sin and Satan. Brass is this in, in scripture represents judgment. Remember the brazen altar, right? Where the animals were sacrificed. The brass serpent lifted up illustrates that sin and Satan was judged on the cross. Sin and Satan was judged on the cross. Every time the serpent bit these people, all they needed to do is look at that pole. Where's that pole? As it, they will live. Don't you think that's a miracle? By looking at that pole, that poison is already spreading everywhere. What to do? No, no, no. You don't worry about that. Just look at the pole. Sin and Satan will, will be taken care of on that brass pole. Gertrude, to answer your question, look at this. When God told Moses, put the brass pole and the serpent, God did not take the serpents away. What does he say? When the serpent bites you, then you look at the pole. He didn't take the serpents away. The serpents were there. It kept biting them. But they, all they had to do is look at the brass pole. You and I can look at Jesus when sin, Satan, and all the force of the devil comes against us. Just look at the cross. Take your focus and say, God, I'm looking at the cross. I want to see the miracle in my life. Right? And then he who hangs on a tree, right, talking about what Jesus did on the cross, the Romans would typically take the dead body off the cross and throw them in the garbage dumps in Jerusalem. Look at that. After this, you know, what they would also do is they would, um, to speed in the death, they would break the people, whoever sac who is being crucified, they would break their knees, break their bones, so death is faster. But the psalmist says, not one of my bones was broken. When Jesus resurrected from the dead, he was not limping and walking. There was no bone broken. Can you think of that? How long does it take to break a bone? One minute. Within a few seconds, he can break a bone. With all the excruciating pain and every suffering that Jesus went through, not even one bone was broken. Do you think Jesus does not know how to look after our body? He can. And he who hangs on the tree, they would take that body and throw it in the garbage dumps. But as it was written, that he would not be, his body will not see decay. The blessings of Abraham included righteousness of, by faith, friendship with God, victory over the enemies, prosperity in the land. And Christ did it for us. We have all these blessings through the cross. Right? Uh, Lucy. Okay, uh, Lucy says, today a medical prescription shows this symbol, the symbol of uh, uh, the brass pole with a snake around it. Uh, but I don't think, Lucy, I don't think that is uh, uh, to show, that's not the reason why they have it. Yeah, it's Christian a Christian thing, no? It's like, uh, I don't think it's a Christian uh, thing. <laughs> It's it's Lucy. It's not a it's not a Christian. It's not because of that, right? Uh, right. That that symbol is just a symbol that they have come up with. Uh, yeah, a, without knowing unknowingly, they are using that, okay. showing people yeah. to look at Jesus Christ. They don't know if they know about it, they might not use it. Uh, yeah. 
and they're yeah, specific. But, yeah, but we, but yeah, what you're saying is right. So, uh, but it's not a Christian. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so I think we'll stop here because if we get into the cross in prof. Okay, let's just quickly do this. Is that okay? Just a few points. I'll just go over overview of this. The cross in prophecy. They will divide his garments. And again, Psalms 2 says against his anointed, which is Jesus. But this is more uh, in detail. They divide his garments. Look at this. Psalm, Psalms 22, 16 to 18. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I, count all, I can count all my bones as they... They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them and my clothing. They cast lots. Think about this. David is writing this he, again thousands of years before and he's saying they, they surround me. I can count my bones. I'm in this weakness. They stare at me. They take my garments. They tear it and they cast lots for it. Did they do that? Exactly what they did. Now, the Roman soldiers didn't open Psalms 22 and say, okay, this is what is written, so let's open Psalms 22. It says this, so let's tell. Roman soldiers don't know who's, what is Psalms. But it was to fulfill the prophecy. The dogs, see, uh, so he's writing in context at that time. The dogs are, uh, you know, the enemies, the, the Roman soldiers, those who are against him. Not one of his bones is broken. He, Psalms 34, 20, his, he guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Fierce witnesses, Psalms 35, 11, fierce witnesses rise up. They ask me things that I do not know. Right? Uh, when you look at uh, Jesus and the people who stood up against him, right? people who came witness, yes, yes, I've seen this person. This Jesus said, you can destroy this temple, I will rise it up in three days. He is the fellow. He is the one. I know his face very well. And he is the one who said, you know, drink of my body, eat of my body, drink of my blood. He's got this whole group of disciples there doing all these miracles and all. He is the one. See the fierce witnesses. But then, my own familiar friend. Psalms 41.9, so beautiful. Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who I ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. Who is this? Talking about it. And he also says, you know, uh, when you read, uh, it also says that for 30 pieces of silver, already done before, prophesied long time back, right? Shame and spitting. Isaiah 50 and verse, 30, and verse 6. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. This has happened. They spat on him. They pulled out his beard. They ridiculed him and mocked him. This is what was written about the cross. Wounded in my friend's house, Zechariah 13, 6. And one will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms? Then he will answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Look at this, the most common one which we all know. Me whom they have pierced, Zechariah 12, 10. And I will pour on the house of David and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. They will look upon me whom they have pierced. We look upon Jesus. Jesus was pierced. Think about this. The, the high priest said, check whether he is dead. The Romans went, Roman soldier went. What did he do? Pierced his side. Fulfilling prophecy. 
just pierced with that spear, pierced his side, fulfilling prophecy written in Zechariah. So everything that happened before the cross, during the cross, after the cross, was all prophesied from the beginning. God had decided it. God had planned it out. God knows what he's doing. God knows what he did then. God knows what he's doing now. God knows what he will do in the future. Everything, God is in control. So that should be our trust. You know, sometimes we see what's happening around us. Looks like everything is out of control. No. The devil may be working. The devil, Satan is working, doing his part. But God is in control. Amen? Do we believe that? God is in control. Sometimes in my weakness, in my when I'm very weak and I'm losing faith, and I, I just say, Psalms 139, says, God, you have ordained all the days of my life in your book. Even before one day came to me, you've written all the days of my life. You know, you know everything that I'm going through. And so we can just trust in him, knowing that God is in control. And uh, he will never fail us. Amen. And, all right, we'll stop here. And uh, next class, we'll get into chapter 16, the cross described. Thank you so much, everyone uh, uh, who joined. Have a good week ahead. Have a good weekend. I'll see you on uh, next week, next Friday. God bless.